بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله الأمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We have with us today hadith number 28 I presume and who will read it for us please Yes brother Narrated Anas ibn Malik A Bedouin came and passed urine in one corner of the masjid. The people shouted at him, but the Prophet stopped them until he finished urinating. The Prophet ordered them to pour a bucket of water over that place, and they did so. In this hadith, the relation between it and the Book of Purity is how to deal with an impurity, with an ajasa, if it's on the ground. Now this hadith has a longer version and it's an authentic hadith this Bedouin was so ignorant that he did not know the etiquettes of Islam what is permissible and what is not permissible in the Sunan this man the Bedouin prayed with the Prophet ﷺ, a particular prayer and during the prayer while he's with the Prophet in prayer with the companions he said oh Allah in a loud voice, so everybody heard it. He said, Oh Allah, forgive Muhammad and me, and don't forgive anyone else. Forgive for Muhammad وسلم, and myself, and do not forgive the sins of anyone else. After the Prophet finished the prayer, والسلام, he brought the man and he said, My friend, my brother, you have made a very wide thing so narrow and limited. Allah's mercy is much, much bigger than only to occupy myself and you after a while the man went into a corner of the masjid uplift his skirt or his apron or his lower garment and started to urinate the companions may Allah be pleased with them saw him he started shouting and screaming and wanted to attack the man the Prophet with his wisdom with his mercy he knew that the harm has been already done. The man started urinating. So the harm is done. And he measured the pros and the cons. So the pros were to stop him. The cons, however, if the companions pursued him and attacked him or shouted at him, he would be frightened. And instead of the impurity be restricted in one area, the man will be frightened and maybe run away. He will put urine on his clothes, on his body, and elsewhere in the masjid while running. So what is the best? The best is wait for him until he finishes. Don't frighten him so that you would not harm him physically if he has to cut himself from or stop himself from urinating. After he was over, the Prophet called him and he said, My son or my brother, these masjids are not made for such filth or for such impurities. They are made for prayer, reciting the Quran, and making dhikr of Allah. And then he instructed his companions to bring a bucket of water and to pour it over the place or the spot where the urine was. He did not instruct him to dig it. He did not instruct him to Isolate it. Very simple. Just pour a bucket of water. The water would mix with the urine. It would go down the earth. And the place would come pure. Alhamdulillah. So from this hadith, the scholars have said and concluded that we must remove the impurity in order for the spot to be clean. And therefore they said, if the entity itself of the impurity has been removed then the spot is being cleaned whether intentionally or not intentionally and this is one of the only things in Islam that you do not need intention for you do not need niya wudu do we need niya yes or no yes we do need intention or niya for wudu if you don't have intention you just automatically do it and after you finish you remember, I didn't want to do wudu. This wudu is invalid. But removing an impurity does not need a niyyah. 
For example, I have a stain of impurity on my clothes and I have it on my bed. My mother comes unknowingly and she washes it, not knowing that there is an ajasa. She washes it normally. She brings that piece of cloth, that shirt, cleaned and ironed. There is no trace for an impurity. So can I wear it? Yes. I did not intend it. Scholar says no need. Even if I have a shirt with najasa hanging on the porch and it rains and it cleans it without me intending it, it's okay. You don't need to have an intention for that. Therefore, the minute the entity itself of the impurity is gone, the place is pure. And whether it's gone by sun, by wind, by any other fluid coming and cleaning it, it is okay as long as it has gone. And this is what happened with that Bedouin. Now, we have to look deeper into this hadith. The Prophet ﷺ was the most merciful messenger with his people. The man did something extremely rude and inappropriate. But how was the reaction of the Prophet ﷺ? Now let us look at our reaction to other Muslims when they make mistakes. I know people, when they see other Muslims making mistakes, they fry them. They almost fry them and eat them alive. Why? Yes, he made a mistake. I have to make an example out of him. This is not the way of the Prophet ﷺ. If someone does a mistake, we have to be like the doctor. What would the doctor do? If you are examining a patient and the patient starts to scream because of the pain, if you smack him in the face, are you a good doctor? This is his nature. He is the patient and you're the doctor. You're the one who's supposed to be tolerant and taking it easy and trying to make things better for him. And likewise, a da'i and likewise a scholar, and likewise a teacher, always have to be with the upper hand, taking care of his students, taking care of his followers, and, and giving them the mercy they need. And definitely, we have to apply this hadith in all aspects of our lives. It is not enough to know this is halal or this is haram. You have to measure the consequences and see the advantages and the disadvantages. And if the advantages are less, while the disadvantages are more, you have to stop. And I give you an example. One of the examples, what is the ruling on changing al-munkar? Changing vice and bad things. It is wajib. Isn't that so? But sometimes it becomes forbidden. When the consequences are far worse when the disadvantages are more it is haram for example a man is drinking whiskey and he's completely wasted he's drunk you can tell by his eyes he's drunk and he's very angry and he has a gun loaded in his hand and you know that he's a Muslim so you say I'm going to go to him and tell him this is haram you're making a major sin and you should stop. If I go and tell him this, I know that he's going to put a bullet between my eyes. So should I go and continue? Scholars say, no, definitely. If you go and continue, you are sinful. Why? Because the disadvantages are far than the advantages. And this is what the Prophet did with the Bedouin, alayhi salatu wasalam. Likewise, someone is extremely sick and ill and he has to take his medication. But he insists that he wants to fast Ramadan. And doctors say, if you fast today, you will die. And he insists and fast. What do we say? Is he sinful? He is sinful. He has made a sin by killing himself while he should have not fasted because Allah gave him the permission. And if we cascade this throughout all of our life, we will be able to give the right judgment in the right time, at the right place. The following hadith, hadith number 29, who will read that for us? 
Yes, brother. Abu Huraira reported, five other acts are the acts of fitrah. Circumcision, shaving the pubic hairs, cutting the moustache, clipping the nails, and plucking the armpit hair. Okay, this hadith was narrated by Abu Huraira and reported in Sahih Imam Muslim and elsewhere. The Prophet والسلام, is indicating to us some of the things that are considered to be part of the fitra. What is fitra? Nature. What is nature? There are two aspects of fitra mentioned in the Quran. The first and foremost important part is the fitra, which is monotheism, a tawheed. This is the fitra that Allah created people on. What is that? The Prophet tells us that whenever a child is born, he is born on the fitra, meaning he's born on Islam. How do you know he's born into Islam? Meaning that if he were to be left alone from all other conditions, he would grow up to believe in the oneness of Allah. Of course, he would not know how to pray. He would not know how to fast. He would not know how to give zakat or make pilgrimage. But the fitrah that Allah is speaking about in the Quran is the monotheism that he created people on. We have a break, so stay tuned, inshallah. We'll be right back. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Wa alihi wa sahbihi wa natada bihudah. And welcome back. So fitra has two meanings. The first, monotheism. This is mentioned in the Quran. And then there is the fitra that the Prophet mentioned to us in a number of hadith. Hadith of Abu Huraira is one of them, mentioning five. There is hadith of Aisha, mentioning ten, as in Sahih al Muslim. And in this hadith, the Prophet says that circumcision is part of the fitra. And why? Is circumcision mentioned in this chapter dealing with purity? Because for men, circumcision is part of perfecting your purity. It is the foreskin that the child is born with on the top of his private part. And the sunnah is on the seventh day is to remove it entirely or most of it. So that if it was not removed, once urinating, there will be still traces of urine because of that foreskin. And circumcision is mandatory for males in Islam. And this is the most authentic opinion. It is part of the nature of human beings. And that is why Ibrahim, peace be upon him, was instructed to circumcise when he was 80 years old. And he circumcised with an axe or with a hammer. Peace and blessing be upon him. And regarding female circumcision, it is an issue of dispute among scholars. The most authentic opinion after gathering all information, it is recommended. It is not a mandatory. That is why a lot of the Muslims don't do it. Because to do it, you need a professional surgeon who has the ability and the knowledge because it's a very delicate operation. Therefore, a lot of the Muslims don't do it, though it is recommended. But for males, it is mandatory and obligatory because it affects their purity and it affects their prayer. And the funny thing is, we are more Christian than the Christians, as some would like to say, because we love Jesus Christ. We believe in his uh, miraculous birth and we circumcise. And the majority of Christians nowadays who claim to love Jesus do not circumcise. So this shows you that our religion comes in line of all divine religions of Allah Azza wa Jal. It is not different than it. It follows the same methodology and the same law of Allah. So the first thing is circumcision. The second thing is removing or shaving the pubic hair and this is for both males and females this is part of the sunnah is it mandatory or not this is an issue of dispute among scholars the most authentic opinion is that it is mandatory providing it does not exceed 40 days so you can have 
the pubic hair, you can't have the armpit, you can't have the nails, you can't have your mustache without cutting it short, providing it does not exceed 40 days. So if it exceeds 40 days, it becomes mandatory to remove these things. Some scholars like Imam Nawawi, may Allah have mercy on his soul, said that even if it did not exceed 40 days, if a person leaves his fingernails or his pubic hair for a week or two and then finds out that it had grown a lot and it is not healthy, it is not hygienic, it is not clean, then he must remove that even if it's less than 40 days. And most Muslims nowadays do it every seven days. They shave their pubic hair as in the hadith, they cut their mustache. Some of them shave their mustache altogether and it's a different of opinion among scholars. The most authentic, you do not shave it. You simply trim it to the roots, very little. But you do not shave it, you have to leave traces of it. And clipping the nails. And we all know that these nails, if you keep them, if you grow them, they are bad place for keeping dirt and for keeping unhealthy things and plucking the armpit. Plucking the armpit for both men and women. And the problem is that nowadays if you go to the gym or if you go to a swimming pool and the brothers are swimming and they take off their shirts, if they raise their hands you will see the jungles of Africa. People have never cleaned themselves. What is this brother? Why don't you remove this filth and hair as the Sunnah is? He said, no, 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 I don't want to look like women. Well, this is not women, this is the Prophet who used to do it. The most man of all men, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he instructed you to do it so you have no excuse. And most of the Muslims do this before Jum'ah, maybe on Thursday, part of washing and cleaning and of their normal routine. There is no sunnah in doing it on Friday. There is no sunnah on removing this hair and clipping your nails on Friday. But if you do it because it is a week of weekend and, and a, a holiday and maybe you're preparing for Jum'ah, I hope inshallah that there is nothing wrong in that. And we move on to hadith number 30. Who will read hadith 30 for us? Narrated Abu Huraira that he met the Prophet of Allah in some of the streets of Medina while he was Junub. I slipped away, went and took a bath. When I came, he said to me, O oh Abu Huraira, where have you been? I told him I was in the state of Janaba. The Prophet said, Subhanallah, a believer never becomes impure. This hadith shows us that a Muslim is never actually impure. He is in the state of impurity. He might have some impurities or najas on his body, but in essence, he is pure because he's a believer. And Abu Huraira in this hadith, he was in the state of Janaba. So he did not want to meet the Prophet or greet the Prophet because he thought that being in the state of Janaba, you should not meet people, especially dignitaries such as the Prophet. But the Prophet corrected his opinion and he told him no the mu'min is never impure even if you were on the state of janaba you're still a mu'min you're still a believer i can give salam to you i can talk to you i can eat with you there is nothing wrong in that however it shows us how the companions of the prophet used to deal with the prophet in all honor respect and dignity and it, we also learn from this hadith that when a person is in the case or in the state of sexual impurity, the, he does not have to hide from people. Some people think that if you're in the state of sexual impurity, you must not leave the house. You must not eat. You must not do this or do that. And this is all wrong. The companions used to leave while being in the state of sexual impurity, Janaba. They used to go for jihad to fight in the cause of Allah when they were in the state of sexual impurity as in the case of Hanbala ibn Amir al-Ghasil Ghasil al-Malaika, the one whom the angels 
washed him between the heavens and the earth when he was martyred in the battle of Uhud. And when the Prophet saw that, he told them, why is Handala being washed by the angels? So they went to his house and checked and they found that he was newly wed a day or two ago. And when he heard the call for jihad, he left his wife without having a total bath. So he was washed by the angels. If this riwayah, if this hadith was authentic, then it means that even the companions used to go out for jihad in the state of Janaba. So when a person is in the state of Janaba, he's requested and instructed to reduce it by, by what? Should I ask individuals or you would promise to wake up? When a person is in the state of Janaba, sexual impurity, he's requested to reduce that state of Janaba with what? With wudu, by performing ablution. And we will come to a hadith where the Prophet Hassan tells us that you can go to sleep while in the state of Janaba if you perform wudu. And likewise, if you would like to go out, if you'd like to eat, just perform wudu so that you would reduce the state of Janaba and be able to leave. So we come to the end of our session. So if you have any questions, any questions. Yes, brother. Is it permissible to read Quran and other uh, ibadah while in the state of Janub? This is a good question. Is it permissible to recite the Quran or other forms of dhikr while in the state of Janaba? It's an issue of dispute among scholars. But the majority, the vast majority of scholars say that it is forbidden. The vast majority of scholars say that reciting the Quran while in the state of Janaba, of sexual impurity, this is not permissible. Why? Because there is a weak hadith, not authentic, weak, that Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, said that nothing used to block or to stop the Prophet ﷺ from reciting the Quran except Janaba. So the majority of scholars use this as the evidence for not allowing people to recite the Quran. Besides, they also refer to the ayah in Surah Al-Waqi'ah, لا يمسه إلا المطهرون, that it should not be touched except by those who were purified. And they use this ayah to refer to touching the Quran physically and to reciting it. But this ayah is not related to touching the Quran. This ayah is referring to the angels who have the preserved tablet, they are the ones who are purified as described in the Quran. The angels are the ones. But for the Muslims, it's an issue of dispute among scholars. So, reciting the Quran, no. You don't recite the Quran because your period of being impure or in the state of Janaba is very short. Prayer is soon coming. So, it is not necessarily for you to recite it now. This is all the time we have. Until we meet next time, fi amanillah, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.